Welcome to our 11th pandemic lecture at the International University College. Authoritarianism, is it contagious? Is it legally infectious? On this issue, Gunther Frankenberg will uh, enlighten us. Gunther has honored us for many years as a teacher here at the IUC. He does have other titles to glory. He is a big boy in Harvard and Frankfurt. And now you have the floor, Gunther. Thank you very much for the generous introduction. I will try to live up to it. And maybe I should say why I did write this. I, th I had the impression that uh, law didn't really cut the mustard in the discussions on uh, how to contain, control corona. I just had the feeling that all kinds of expertise seem to be prevailing, especially, of course, virology. And I thought, why is it? I mean, I'm not saying that it's important that we lawyers are always upfront, but I just thought, why? What makes our this sort of professional expertise so, I'd, I would almost say, useless in this situation? And then I that's why I wrote this short essay and then I will, uh, because I'm also working on authoritarianism and on uh, why societies sort of turn authoritarian or even more authoritarian uh, in times of um, epidemics or pandemic. So let me just start. I will just, uh, I read it because I didn't know what, uh, what would be best. So I will read this very short essay it's like eight pages, and then we can discuss it, of course, uh, depending the honorarium is okay. I mean, we haven't talked about that. But, uh, so my first point is about uncertainty and expertise. Law doesn't tolerate doubt. Rulings have to convince so as to be accepted as authoritative. Interpretations are meant to provide det determinant, at least plausible results. Legal education and practice are geared towards certainty. And later, the opinions of legal experts, lawyers, often cloak the interests of the client behind a screen of definite assumptions and conclusions. Uncertainty, and that's my first conclusion, uh, and that I think is certain, is not a matter for the legal profession. We cannot deal with uncertainty. COVID-19 teaches lawyers neither to comfortably issue coercive measures, decrees, nor to make gutsy statements, judgments, but to learn what the pandemic is all about first. Legal consultants need to find their place in the dispute of the faculties. Virology, epidemiology, med medicine, of course, they come first. They have yet to define their role as advisors, politics, of course while all the time operating in a floating terrain that offers little factual certainty, leaves open many questions, requires from experts to constantly check and revise their tentative prognoses, to process new data and changing criteria. This all is pretty terrible for lawyers. That's my second argument. Throughout all societies, the pandemic is spreading and with it, the uncertainty of how and with which legal means and measures to contain and control it. So far, politics follow the diverse and unstable assessments from the intellectual laboratories of virology, first and foremost, then epidemiology and some medicine. And lawyers have to find comfort in their lagging legal contributions to flatten the curve or to Let's go for herd immunity or reduce the rate of reduction of infections or let's put a cap on hotspots and more. You all know this. Generally, lawyers are satisfied with contributing to prevent the overburdening of the intensive care capacities. But what exactly do we or do they contribute? There are some aspects of the pandemic that are or seem to be certain. Corona can only be compared to, with earlier influenza viruses at the price of great inaccuracy. The virus is highly contagious. 
Corona is spreading rapidly as a droplet infection, but selectively because it threatens especially the old and those who have an underlying health condition, notably of the respiratory tract. And then there are approximate estimates with low half-lives for, for instance, COVID-19 diseases, mortality rates, reproduction rates, and infection chains. So we know something, but not much. Little is known about the average duration of intensive care treatment, and even the benefit of protective masks is controversial, even today that we have been ordered to wear them almost all the time. Presently, virologists, politics, and the media treat the flat infection curves and infection rates below zero, below one, sorry, like a mantra. The numbers of people already cured are exhibited on a daily basis like a monstrance, and the body count does not mean much as long as testing is still sporadic, which is almost in our country, sporadic. In the dispute of the faculty, faculties one witnesses how the voices from the natural sciences are heard first and loudest, followed by economics, then the social and human sciences, and then maybe psychologists who warn about the effects of ch shutdowns, social distancing and isolation, and even social workers who report an increase in domestic violence, suicides, and of course, the damage done on children. Law comes as an also ran. Legal experts who should rule by argument and assertion do not seem to have much purchase in these debates about strategies of how to confront the pandemic. Legal expertise is traded in very small coins. Lawyers talk about what is unconstitutional or illegal, or at least not proportionate. At the end of the day, they always ask for balancing. Balancing is the big thing. Caution suggests that lawyers should not bend over the relevant legal norms and ask whether the legal relevant norms give away what has been imposed on us. This is quoted from a, a German, former German constitutional court lawyer. If everything is or could be different, then law must change and start to learn under conditions of uncertainty. This is my second thesis. We have time for that because Corona will be around for quite a while. And I assume that a vaccine is not likely to solve the problem soon, if ever. Because if you compare uh, Corona with other, you, you will find out that, for instance, it took for almost 40 years to find a vaccine for the dengue. It, we still haven't found a vaccine against the HIV, et cetera, et cetera. And also the other corona, uh, the other core uh, viruses haven't been sort of effectively uh, contained by, by a vaccine. So what about learning? So I, I, I differentiate in the following two types of learning, the conventional legal learning that we have in police law and, or you could also say the law for averting dangers and the security law, which is more the, the more modern type, uh, as I will tell you, and then the emergency law. So we have three types of learning or rather non-learning. For selective case-by-case -case learning, the security laws of many countries traditionally worked with and processed information according to the danger to safety scheme, meaning that if there is a danger to safety, the uh, sort of normal measures can be issued in order to diffuse the threatening situation. To cushion the consequences of dangerous technologies, Ulrich Beck study on the risk society that reads like a commentary on Chernobyl in 1968, generalized this concept of danger and offered risk instead as a more abstract statistical category um, rather than danger. So uh, that became the second, so in a way that became the second step away, when the first step away from conventional lane learning in the context of police laws. Under the banner of the fight against terrorism and organized crime, the rule of law matrix 
threats to security trigger proportionate measures morphed into a pattern for averting risk. This happened in many Western countries, Germany, Italy, the United States, France, everywhere. Where well, the dynamic and attractive, because more abstract, category of risk took the lead, danger receded into the background. In consequence, the threshold for police action became vague and was significantly lowered. In turn, police law took on the character of a very flexible, hyper-preventive security law, which insatiably collected and hoarded data and brought them to bear in the face of imp imperceptible information-dependent and cross-border threats. Above all, eavesdropping and surveillance measures that that means interventions that have a wide scope and reach far beyond any clear and present danger zone signaled the transition from police law to a special police law in which actual clues, situation assessments, and experiences furnished by the police guide their interventions. Would this security law qualify as a learning law? I would say rather a danger invention law that produces self-reflexively its own information and is hardly open to unsettling data from the outside. While conventional security statutes at best provide for learning from case to case, firmly entrenched in their law rule categories, the new security law incorporates the emergency and therefore runs the risk of constantly seeing the world in a state of exception, or you could also say seeing the world in the categories of emergency. In many democracies, control and containment of epidemics either come under emergency law or follow the regulatory pattern of conventional police law. Some including what I would call normalized emergency provisions as the following examples show. All of them limit learning processes according to their regulatory scheme. Usually these laws have a friendly title like the consolidated health laws in Italy and many other countries like Australia and France or the German Infection Protection Act. But they are tough on the matter, meaning because they process the collective traumas produced by past epidemics like the plague, cholera, typhoid fever, the Spanish influenza, etc. They are fairly, they have fairly strict uh, provisions for, for rather rigid I would say normalized emergency measures. As a rule, they normalize and generalize the state of exception by inserting broad, extraordinary measures into the law as, and they appear there as ordinary situation, uh, ordinary regulations, sorry. The Italian consolidated health laws establish that the Minister of Health may issue a list of infectious and communicable diseases that are subject to special procedures and measures. The statute sets up a system of reporting, provides for preventive measures, necessary assistance, mandatory medical treatment, and disinfection intervention. This is very common. It's not sort of, it's not just uh, Italy. It's uh, you find this in many countries if you check or compare the public health statutes. For epidemics or pandemics, it complements the regulatory scheme by authorizing the Minister of Health to issue special orders for the inspection and disinfection of premises, the organization of special services and medical assistance and the adoption of protective measures against the spread of such diseases. And the, likewise, the German Infection Protection Act corresponds to the danger prevention design of the Italian consolidated health laws but complements and intensifies it by providing for emergency measures that are normalized, which is to say, treated as standard modus operandi. Though always already leaning to public health with an eye to the state of exception, the recent re revision in this year during the COVID-19 crisis quite openly launched extraordinary measures. Notably, it empowered the federal minister of health to sidestep laws and rule by decree once the federal diet, Germany had declared an epidemic situation of national importance. 
the regime of containing the further spread of an infection thus installed is reminiscent of the infamous emergency ordinances which contributed to the decline of the Weimar Republic and the erosion of its constitution. Furthermore, the corona ordinances and general decrees of the Länder, the member states of the Federal Republic of Germany, intense, extensively exhaust the authorization framework offered by the national statute. They authorize the necessary protective measures to the extent and for as long as necessary to prevent the spread of communicable diseases. So I don't want to give you all the, the various measures, so let, uh, we can come back to that in the discussion if you want. Federal and state governments have agreed on extremely strict measures that were gradually eased. This was like uh, four weeks, six weeks ago. And the easing started two weeks ago. Others such as mobile phone tracking has been introduced, but not on a voluntary basis this week. And surveillance by drones happened to serve uh, because uh, to, uh, the police wanted to control assemblies. So far, national infection prevention schemes do not show any signs that they are irritated by the corona uncertainties, or that there is a special willingness to address and learn more about its peculiar features. In her first speeches to the nation, Chancellor Merkel, who normally is not one of my close friends, seemed to pursue a different strategy though. Rather than clearly framing social distancing and staying at home as decrees or ordinances or administrative acts, meaning in, in a terminology that we are used to, um, she called them with a touch of vagueness, guidelines, instructions for action, rules, but not in the English rule sense. And most recently, she referred to them as standards then by avoiding to name definite directives and stressing that the corona rules are not mere recommendations, she relies what I would call the semantics of approximation. It may very well be, I think, that the vagueness she sort of extols currently may be a virtue by appropriately communicating the uncertainty surrounding the pandemic. This applies to, um, to four weeks ago when Merkel was still at least in charge or in charge with the uh, minister of presidents of the states. Now she is sort of has receded to the backgrounds because the states have taken over. I mean, the easing phase is more in the hands of the lender. Admittedly, in the decrease in ordinances issued primarily by states and local authorities, infection protection steps out of Angela Merkel's shadow of a gentle prerogative and shows its blades. Its blades. Or would the chancellor, in conjunction with other decision makers, of course, at state level have had to declare a real state of exception, if only for reasons of clarity? In fact, a state of emergency could have distracted from the question of whether the enabling norms of the German national statute for infection protection or the ordinances they support, for example, such as the nationwide lockout uh, or shutting down plants uh, are compatible with the German constitution, with the basic law. But what state of exception could Angela Merkel have possibly declared an epidemiological situation of national importance had to be and was announced by parliament. So it wasn't up to her to say that. Moreover, it appears to be a spurious state of emergency, which lets the Minister of Health off the hook following the unfortunate example of Weimar. And it would be bogus, it's wording carefully avoiding exception or emergency. With less caution, one might consider it unconstitutional as far as it can be assumed that this epidemiological situation disrupts the typical states of exception enumerated in the basic law. 
in the 1968, we demonstrated, of course, against um, the German sort of emergency law that was uh, then integrated into the basic law. And we always thought this is the end of the world. We had a great time actually demonstrating. And it turned out these um, typified situations of emergency didn't really do much harm because they seemed to be sort of um, based on historical experiences. And they, there was nothing that, uh, that could be used, that were useful uh, in, the, in the present, I mean, in the post-68 era, but we didn't see that, of course. We thought this typification is, 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 is evil, is the end of uh, what, what just started to be the German uh, democracy. Just to give you a few examples, the situation of a legislative emergency is so far off, it has never happened. And, and, and it has nothing to do also right now with Corona. The suppression of armed insurgents is sort of is based on, on images from maybe the, the mid 19th century. And you cannot really imagine now armed insurgents maybe fighting for protective um, pro protective clothing or test kits at the German Polish border. So you can see it's, it really doesn't really do much harm. It doesn't do much help either. And the only thing that could be useful and that you find also in other constitutions is a clause that allows the military to support the police or the states to be supported by the national government when there is a catastrophe or national disaster. Um, and that doesn't help also very much because it is, in a way, it sort of, it says what we, it, it, it's more about cooperation. It, it doesn't get that, it doesn't say what these, what the military can do in this situation. So by the same token, as a decent democratic governor like Angela Merkel, I think she is fairly decent, certainly would not want authoritarian leaders to prompt her to declare a state of exception. At any rate, most autocrats launch their anti-corona measures after declaring a state of exception or a state of emergency or a state of calamity because they habitually operate in this mode. For them to declare it is not much. In order to prevent the possible accident and misfortune that they might lose power, it's not about the corona or anything else. To list a few example, uh, examples, President Rodrigo Duterte of the Philippines ordered the shooting of quarantine violators. Indian Prime Minister Modi initially recommended Ayurveda and homeopathic treatment to manage uh, the COVID-19 disease. Later he commanded with little advance warning a national lockdown and condoned police brutality against people suspected of violating, violating quarantine rules because they simply couldn't get home. They were really stuck in cities like Mumbai or Delhi. Some autocrats used the corona crisis as a Machiavellian moment to gain power premiums by loosening parliamentary controls or sort of uh, disabling the courts or striking down the opposition. Until mid-March of uh, 2020, neither comprehensive restrictive steps nor additional powers were on the agenda of President Erdogan's anti-corona policy, who is always good for uh, authoritarian moves. Because this, the Turkish president did not need to donate himself emergency powers, as he had already accomplished that after the strange coup in 2016. Journalists and members of the opposition continue to be targeted. In Hungary, Viktor Orban took a significant step to consolidate his autocracy by removing parliamentary control of his decrees. I mean, he already controls with his Fidesz party uh, the parliament and turning criminal law against the opposition with a statute that holds a, <clears throat> a prison sentence for up to five years for spreading false information about COVID-19 and of course government policies. Uh, the corona crisis 
crisis hit the regime in Algeria at a very unfortunate moment when the oil prices, with the oil prices falling and tourism declining, it has no convincing argument to contain the still lively protest undaunted by COVID-19, the protest that ended the, the long, long, long reign of the previous president. By proxy, Xi Jinping cracked down on the protest movement in Hong Kong. In contrast, the royal government of Bhutan went down the Swedish path. Uh, this is on a more pleasant note, at least held a middle ground between denial and state of exception. It ordered a quarantine and surveillance of the closely controlled borders without declaring the state of emergency, which seems pretty uh, liberal or pretty laid back. After trivializing the virus and the COVID-19 disease, Brazil's president Jair Bolsonaro appeared to follow the lead of municipal and state authorities and finally asked Congress to approve the government decree declaring public calamity so as, uh, so as to be able to spend beyond the limit of fiscal responsibility law and the, the law and face the emergency situation. His erratic male chauvinist course of action cannot be trusted though and since then he has already changed it and he is, uh, I mean he's just a really outrageous person and the situation in Brazil as we all know is really has really gotten very terrible. Not to forget Europe's last dictator, in his own words, Alexander Lukashenko. He remains one of the last outliers who remain in denial and shun any serious anti-corona measures, still believing that being in a good mood and doing rural work, he calls it the tractor therapy, will do the job. So maybe we should all be in a good mood and uh, do our job so but we don't have tractors usually so to protect ourselves against the virus under the sign of the pandemic some more or less democratically elected heads of state appear to be bent on joining the phalanx of their openly authoritarian colleagues if we look around in india south africa the philippines brazil hungary of course the united states france and elsewhere the executive practices of governing, governing illustrate that states of emergency are not tailored to learning experiences. This is my, my question. Does it help you to learn or does it prevent us from learning? But rather to reward authoritarian gestures and stabilize autocracy. One of them, Emmanuel Macron, narcissistically offended by having to fear not being reelected soon vainly and foolishly declared nous sommes en guerre the other donald trump fluctuates erratically between denial idiotic statements that reveal utter ignorance and lack of concern and in addition insidious dramatization uh, also of course because he is looking forward to november when there will be an election Finally, after the situation had become really dramatic in the US, he arrived at war rhetoric like his colleague Macron and declared a state of emergency while simultaneously suggesting that things got better and the economy would be opened again soon as well as holding China and the WHO responsible for the pandemic. This is also a pattern that we, if you look at the history of epidemics and pandemics it's always um the enemy is always outside it's always the the french disease in in england and the english disease in france it's the 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 spanish flu which is not spanish at all so this is a constant a constant pattern of course in china it's a western uh, corona is a western thing they have a harder time to argue that but uh, so let's come, the, just a last note uh, on the Italian state of exception. The Italian practice is different, but also neither suitable for imitation nor learning. The state of emergency and the blockade imposed on the country showed signs of despair. At least this is my 
you from the outside over a disaster the, go <clears throat> the government and its administration were unable to control, especially in Lombardy. There is, by the way, a very interesting article that some of you may have read. It's in Il Post, uh, and it's, um, the date is, I think, the 7th of May. And you find it in the internet. It's very detailed. It's very, I mean, see, I, at least, I learned a lot. The cascade of measures released under uh, the national umbrella cut deeply into civil liberties. Certainly, Article 77 of the Italian Constitution entitles the government to take extraordinary action on its own responsibility in cases of urgency and necessity. For a national curfew, however, this cloak of legality seems to me to be quite thin and short. But who asks about the law when death is on the doorstep? Now I come to the, the, heart, the heart of my critique of the standard legal responses, which is balancing ends and means. Lawyers will probably have to do that, ask about the law, even if the world were to end. However, they should be prepared for uncertainty on a global and previously unknown scale. It is quite inadequate to continue what ministers of public health have been doing in the past and, of, and what may account for the irrelevance of law and lawyers in the dispute of the faculties today, namely to pick the conventional legal cutlery for handling the law on epidemics, to check whether its present use is proportionate and rush to balance corona means and corona ends. It's almost tragic, I think, to what extent legal analyses circle around proportionality of social distancing, lockdowns, shutdowns, and other interventions that have far-reaching consequences for society, the economy, politics, psychological dispositions, women's burden, and children's hearts and minds. I think especially uh, uh, for personal reasons, although I find that children are really um, not taken care of in all these legal balancing practices. Lawyers seem not to realize that anti-corona measures not only infringe freedoms, this is the standard line, but transform everyday lives and disrupt the social tissue of the afflicted societies. First, the principle of proportionality had to leave feathers in the already mentioned conversion of police law into a generalized, more abstract risk law or security risk law, uh, which reduced the density of judicial and other controls and uh, prevented the courts from grasping or sort of really controlling police interventions. And so their proportionality was really thinned out and it was, became meaningless. Second, in the wake of the COVID-19 pandemic, the currently prevailing social conditions have been completely disrupted. And an end of the disruption is not in sight, even if society seemed to be functioning okay or normally. But I think the, 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 the standard social tissue has been disrupted and we have to relearn how we sort of uh, how we continue like how we can we do schooling how can we do university how can we open up workplaces etc third uh, the pandemic has meanwhile globalized the goals and means that are used to control and contain covid 19 infections flat curves herd immunity declining number of new infections Limits for regional hotspots, etc., have to be assessed and weighed as legitimate ends against the consequences of means. Means are social distancing, isolation, lockdowns, shutdowns, fact of factories, businesses, schools, daycare facilities, and many, many more. You all know this. What I'm saying is that it's such a, if you really take, um, the principle of proportionality seriously, you end up in such a complex or rather over complex 
um, conglomerate of items that you have to weigh normatively and then I mean first you have to identify them and then you have to weigh them that it's uh, I would say that lawyers and judges who dutifully comply with the ever-changing virological prognoses cannot do this they just simply cannot do this because they're always following uh, the new line that is being prompted by a virologist. I mean, in Germany, is this is uh, incredible. I'm not saying it's bad here, but it's it's. I would say it's just bad in the sense of that I have no sense of of legal control of this, or that lawyers are meaningful. Maybe they shouldn't be uh, in this discussion because it's not so important. Fourth, balancing has always been open-ended and unpredictable. And I would argue it has always been more a metaphor than a stringent me method. Now, a neat balancing of ends and means has to identify and factor in a sheer endless number of items, as I just said, such as bankruptcy, unemployment, domestic violence, depression, disrupted educational careers, social isolation, the cumulative negative impact on women working under precarious, dangerous conditions, children being deprived of their life chances. Children don't even, they don't even understand what's going on, the little ones. So it is, and then there are questions like, is it proportionate to lock up the elderly in residential care homes, even if they would prefer to see their families and accept the risk of death? Is it proportionate to keep daycare facilities closed, even if children develop serious symptoms of social isolation, like the, I think it's called this, the Kawasaki syndrome. Is it proportionate to keep schools closed, even if a smart infection protection plan would allow part-time schooling in small groups? Is it proportionate to order a lockdown with barely any time for preparation, as happened in India, as I said before? To reduce complexity, because this is really overly complex, obviously, some authors in the debates opt for one or the other highest value. So then you have no balancing, but you have a you you privilege one value like life or death or health or dignity, even death in dignity, rather than the protection of mere health and naked life, and that have to be balanced against other items. Thus, they try to escape from the grammar of an exigent balancing method and avoid the me mechanics of proportionality that have ossified in routine. And I would say, argue, um, uh, I would argue they amount to little more than during a pandemic as a, than legitimizing the evident rationality of infection protection. Like if virologists say we need a flat cur curve, you can say that lawyers will be able to follow up and come up with a proportionality rationale. If they say, well, we just have to uh, reduce the sort of the transmission of infections and it has to be, the rate has to be below one, I'm sure you find people who say, yeah, okay, we, can, we can handle this with proportionality. So now I come to my last point. And I, my argument is that I think we need uh, a new kind of law, a new legal thinking that sort of, sort of I would say it's, that is more ready to experiment rather than uh, focus on security immediately and then try to figure out how I can I do this in terms of proportionality. The coronavirus and the COVID-19 infection call for a step towards a law with a more flexible open texture that integrates new ideas and per perspectives that allows for experimenting and learning rather than relying on more or less centralized command and control control structures and, and legitimizing them. Co-determination and voluntariness need to be introduced as, an, as new principles without which even the, prohibi the prohibition supported and compulsively enforced imperative protection against the infection ultimately cannot work. At any rate, washing your hands, staying at home, and also social distancing at workplaces in public spaces and educational um, facilities cannot be reliably supervised and enforced by an authoritarian regulatory model. 
as maintained by the standard police laws or even by the more advanced and more what I would call it more dangerous uh, sort of uh, security risk laws and even more by what what I call introduced as the normalized state of exception. In contrast to conventional and extraordinary schemes of infection protection, uncertainty demands that other sources of information be tapped. There is no good reason to assume that individuals who want to protect themselves, their families, their workplaces, businesses, have nothing to contribute to containing the pandemic if properly supervised by public health authorities. On the contrary, groups have already proven capable of organizing public assemblies and fairly strictly obeying the rules of social distancing. Shop owners who want to do business in times of a pandemic can be required to work out and submit to inspection practical concepts of how to protect their customers and their staff. Supermarkets have demonstrated how to meet this, this expectation. So it's not uh, unrealistic. Schools and universities organize learning processes. So they might as well organize ways and means of self and other protection. For instance, my 15-year-old um, son now goes to, for, for the last two weeks, he goes to school Monday afternoon. I mean, I'm not saying that he learns too much, but he had been desperate to meet his buddies so why couldn't we have done this like six weeks ago or eight weeks ago uh, because they broke up the class in in little groups and then they would say yeah so if we do this for the whole school you can only have one afternoon and one afternoon is better than hanging out at home with your frustrated parents all the time according to practical reason laws that are meant to protect from infection could and would have to change their modality from coercion, which chafes with time, to incentives, from penalties which might lose their edge once people die by the thousands, to trial and error, from infection paternalism to co-determination and a modicum of solidarity, you can also say empathy, with rules that instruct how to work out and enforce security plans rather than provisions that prohibit with legal education and consultation instead of deterrence. Experiments should be there to approach Corona with a sub, you could call it a supply oriented law, not a law that condones violence, but one that is geared towards participation of those who are affected. The new law that I think we have to work out, it's, these are just very tentative ideas. Regulating how to cope with the pandemic is a, is a, or would be a societal experiment. Everyone, especially the most vulnerable, would still have to protect themselves. It's, a, it's not taking the, the responsibility away from them. But the law could focus on supporting those who need special assistance or maybe need supervision, but not more. They don't need prohibition. Uh, and the law could sort of offer organized social services rather. Volunteers can be reckoned with as the willingness to help refugees in 2015 teaches us. Provided that civil society is no longer placed under house arrest and demobilized by ordinances and decrees, but is involved in the discussion about how and the actual doing of what the pandemic requires. I mean, this is, one could say, well, now we're in the, the ease phase, but easing doesn't solve this problem because in case Corona comes back in the fall or next year, we still have, the, we, I think we still need a law that can handle this more aptly than what we have done in the, in the we have, what we have seen in the past. If this experiment founders because people don't play along. I mean, this is also the, the fellow traveler or the risk taker problem. I would say then the state may have lost some time, but would have gained valuable knowledge about people's behavior, other than abstract models can provide, and could have concentrated meanwhile on procuring 
protective clothing and respiratory equipment, supply and test kits, promoting the search for vaccines and medication, and in particular, actively supporting medical treatment and healthcare services, which is crucial in countries where public health has been privatized terribly during the past 10 years. Society would have learned painfully that a pandemic requires all of us to cooperate and participate in developing protection concepts, unless we do not mind the country to be run like a leprosy ward and its inmates. Disoriented by virus scare, acquiesce in states of exception, and take nationwide shutdowns and lockdowns to be proportionate. And the law? It is rarely any wiser, wiser than the society whose collective behavior it regulates. As long as it is to be applied in a situation of uncertainty, my argument is there is no choice. It simply must learn. One may hope that its staff, the legal staff, has already learned one thing. Sovereign is she who does not declare a state of exception and who does not normalize it under the flags of epidemic control. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Frankenberg, for this rich presentation. There are many points on the floor and we have a first contribution by Cristina Mosalaghe. Christina, you have the floor. Uh, thank you, Pepe. Thank you, Professor Frankenberg, for a really interesting uh, presentation. Um, I just want to double click um, on um, just the learning aspect because um, I wasn't too clear on it. Um, and just to understand from your perspective the outcomes of learning. Um, and the reason I say the outcomes of learning is because I, I wasn't sure, uh, like, sort of how do you expand that? Uh, what is it exactly um, that we are to learn? Because from my perspective, we are already learning. Um, that a lot of the systems that we perceive uh, have authoritarian aspects and are increasing so that they're gaining traction. And so in some ways we are already learning and, and starting to see the issues of the systems um, that, we are, that we are in. And I want to link this to your book on authoritarian constitutionalism, uh, because there I think you criticized um, the, almost the facade of liberal constitutionalism. So that, uh, you know, so you, you created the grid and you, you placed uh, different constitutions on that grid um, and expressed the fact that a lot of liberal constitutions actually put up the facade of being liberal, but at the same time are, uh, display a lot of authoritarian characteristics. Um, and going back to that learning aspect, are we not actually seeing those countries that were, you know, sort of put up the facade of being liberal constitutionalist countries now displaying more and more of their authoritarian characteristics? And so I want to know whether or not um, that classification that you created there still holds or whether or not certain countries have perhaps shifted on the scale towards leaning towards more authoritarian or less authoritarian. Um, and then just like the, the, the last thing being wanting to double click on, um, just the experience of the US especially, I think for me is, is quite um, an interesting one, uh, especially how would you perceive um, that situation? And where would you place it on the scale in terms of authoritarianism? Mm -hmm. Baby, can I answer or should we collect some? Uh, let's uh, go first for the uh, questions by Christine and then we'll collect some others. Okay, because there, there were three questions already. So the, the, the first, first question, yes, I would say we are learning. I mean, I, I mean, all of us, I mean, we're here we are learning right now. But what I'm, my argument is that I think the legal structures are set in a way that prevent learning processes, that prevent the information that is... Uh, necessary to be processed and the information requires that people uh, and not just author, sort of the uh, office the state offices people should be involved in this like uh, and I, I find it crucial to and maybe the the example is too simple but i think why in the hell why the hell did they close bookstores in bookstores here you will not find more than five people, two from the staff, three customers. So it would have been easy from the very beginning and not since last week to keep the bookstore open and to require from the, 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 the shop owner, give us a good idea how you will protect people who come as, and, and shop in your, and what will you be doing? Like they did this in the, in the supermarkets, for instance. The supermarkets were never closed. 
I mean, they could have closed the supermarkets. Of course, then we would have a revolution here because we had nothing to eat. And they, they, they asked the, con the supermarkets from the very beginning to, you have seen this, I mean, that they sort of insulate these at the cashiers, which I think they should do even if we don't have a, a corona around, because I think it's pretty awful if people who have sort of, as we say in Germany, a wet expression, if they talk to you and instead of just giving you the money, I mean, give me a break. So this is what I mean, learning doesn't, uh, I think I want the law to learn and I think the law is stuck in a set of structures, the police law structure, the security law structure, and the, you could say, the variations of emergency law structures. And that is always, in a way, it's sort of self-generating information, but it's not sort of getting irritated and getting information from the outside. The second, uh, have, have with regard to the, yes, I think most liberals, the, the states that, that most liberal states uh, are, have become more authoritarian. And I'm, I'm doing a, some kind of research with a colleague whether it's sort of a pattern that whenever you have a pandemic or epidemic, the countries sort of slip into a more authoritarian phase. And I think whether they are liberal or liberal democracies or socialist democracies doesn't make any difference. And I think that will be the result. And I, my, my hunch is, yes, many have become more authoritarian, or at least they have brought out the authoritarianism that was latent. And the U.S. is just terrible. My daughter lives in New York and my grandchild. So for me, this is really, I mean, this is, I, I, I would prefer to be there. I mean, I love this discussion, but I wanted to be there. And I think it's just terrible. And it's, for me, it is really hard to believe that um, at this day and age, we have a majority of people, at least a significant number of people, uh, voting for people like Trump or Bolsonaro. I think I cannot, I think they are clinical, clinically idiotic in, in there. And I think people should realize this, even if they share their, their authoritarian or, or right-wing views. I think I cannot understand it. If he gets reelected, I cannot, I mean, I lose all faith. Thank you so much, Professor. There is a question by Lawrence McFalls. Lawrence, you have the floor. Uh, yes, thank you. Um, thank you very much. I was very fascinated by your typology of police, uh, security, and emergency law. And um, you, you seem to suggest that the, the, the field of security law was the most complex because it sort of nourished itself from, from both ends, that is from police law and and emergency law. Yes. And in this context, you uh, you also praised Angela Merkel for as being a decent Democrat who didn't go looking for emergency law powers, but instead elaborated the notion of, of guidelines. And that seems to be connected to what you were finally saying about um, civil society engaging in in creating norms, um, but I'm, I'm curious about the role of self-policing, uh, the extraction of society and individuals from legal norms, uh, which becomes almost a, a stateless fantasy of, of uh, even a, an anarchist vision of what could be a, a response mm -hmm. Uh, now, I, I'm wondering if you just elaborate on, 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 on this space of, of, of security law, the, the role of, of guidelines, what, what is the legal status of, of a guideline, um, and how might this be leading to uh, maybe not a anarchist utopia, but to a self-policing dystopia? Go directly, Gunther, let's have an exchange on this. Okay, because it's, I really like your idea that, that um, you say that I find security law particularly dangerous because it sort of 
draws energy from the old police law and from the, the emergency law. I think this is a wonderful picture and I may, I hope I can use it for the next time I publish this. <laughs> um, and I also like the idea of the, of anarchism. There is something anarchic, maybe because I have been a lawyer for such a long time, also a practicing lawyer and, and not just a legal scholar. And I, I really think I don't know. I mean, this generation has to make sure maybe Corona is a chance that we get sort of this anarchic element back into the law, which has become so bureaucratic, especially public health, because, of course, public health is, you could say, is really sort of covered by these traumas and they they we don't want to have the plague. We don't want to have cholera again. We don't want to have this, we, I mean, we don't want to go back to the 19th century, the Spanish uh, flu, etc. So I think that's why we give uh, the state or the states uh, so much uh, power and not really asking, is this really necessary? Is this proportionate? In a way we give away this and I think we, we should really be, um, uh, sort of be more anarchic or the law should should allow, I, I would call it experimental because if you say anarchic, you have the secret service uh, in your backyard. Uh, and with Angela Merkel, I found it when, when I heard the first speech and ju just, I just thought maybe this is her second moment where I really admire her. The, the other one was of course, when she said, hey, let's keep the, the borders open in 2015, I really thought this is really a decent person. And there were so few decent persons in politics. And I, for, for a lawyer, I thought it was extremely interesting that she avoided what I would call the blades that we use to, to operate the, the, the law. And then I think my, I, maybe she had an idea that we would, we need a different kind, maybe, it was an anarchical terminology. So let's just be, not say recommendation, not say uh, sort of an administrative act, just sort of in between. I really liked that. And I thought it was good and it helped Germany to pursue, I would say a decent course. Lawrence? Um. I would just wonder whether we're not looking at the iron fist in a velvet glove. Would be. Uh, I, I, I fall sometimes for Angela Merkel too, uh, but, I, but I'm always a, a, bit, a bit distrustful of uh, any time we turn things over to, to, to some sort of idea of voluntary measures of self-control. It's... Yeah. Uh, it's, it's always that's probably better than the options. It's probably better than the options, but I, I still I still have to keep a critical eye on it. Yeah, there's always Foucault in the background that keeps yeah. me from falling for her. I mean, I <laughs> I would say <laughs> in the in the, the debate that we had in so many countries, and have followed it sort of in France, in Germany, in Poland, in Hungary, in the U.S. and in India. I was in India just before the the whole thing. Uh, uh, broke loose and it was just it was so terrible and I just thought yeah the, why can't we just say she is decent I will not fall for her uh, she is not but maybe her legal concept that she wouldn't even spell out and of course she will not pursue it under pressure that's the problem keeps me from falling for her but I think there is an idea that I thought I can use this and it, maybe it helps us if we think about why can't we have an experimental law that would sort of, we need new categories. And maybe that is an, a moment of, yeah, there were new categories. So I would, the second time in my life, I defend her a little bit. <laughs> okay, thank but you. But not fall for her. <laughs> thank you, Gunther and uh, Lawrence. Uh, who else? The floor is open. Uh, Mariella, Mariella Pittari. Mariella, you have the floor. Uh, can you hear me? Very well. Okay, sorry. Um, just taking 
this transfer transferring of police power to private citizens private authorities how you see that uh you know taking that one of the leading cases adopted all over the world as a paradigmatic case is the old case of you know the direct application of fundamental right, uh, rights to private parties that now they have this power to exercise authority of over private citizens how can we stand up before uh, some measures that are against co uh, constitutional rights and things like that private parties exercising administrative bureaucratic authority over citizens how do you see that i would say my ideas won't work and they won't cut the mustard if we cannot contain the public health bureaucracy if we cannot sort of um, we have to sort of in a way we have to dismantle the national health statutes which are very similar uh, in in most countries i mean very similar and if we do if we cannot sort of prevent if there is a crisis if we cannot pre prevent governments from immediately declaring the state of exception because declaring the state of exception doesn't solve anything and they 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 so if we can't do this my ideas or my this the, the idea of an experiment or you could say of a return to anarchism doesn't work ugo doesn't like that because he's not an anarchist he likes more the people the hardliners <laughs> you understand is that i i cannot really answer your question because i'm what i'm saying is i'm calling for something and i think there are some steps that are really modest they could be taken and uh, they for instance with when our when to give you another example when the schools were opened again partially so when when they could go for half a day uh, we had a in my in the, in the school of my son we had a a, a case of corona and the, the the boy was infected by that was sort of then ascertained by his parents and then other fathers called immediately for uh, the sh the cool the school should be locked down for, until the vacation this is the i would say this is the kind of mentality that feeds the the i would say the the structures that i have tried to describe and we need to get beyond that we have to, so we fought against this and we said we have to keep the schools open even if we're all worried about our children i mean but it, that's not the answer the answer cannot be you have a, an incident an incidence of corona okay lock it down you have whether it's a supermarket or a school or the university it's when they, we shouldn't do this uh thank you so much i i felt one day i had an experience in the grocery shop and i felt that i was in the army because everyone was regulating me in all situations that i was trying you know to to be there and i think the government is setting the guidelines and i think you, the way that you just touched now the school issue which is okay the government is it's putting the guidelines out there but then the private authorities are doing whatever they want with our private lives and we don't have how to handle why we are not using this opportunity of low calm you know after that the pandemic hit the uh, the highest death rates and everything to discuss the democratic measures that not only government but citizens and private parties can sure. engage i think you uh, totally correctly uh, addressed this issue thank you so much well in fact uh, the coronavirus has given to the most improbable people some power from security guards to mayors who wants to take the floor on this the floor is open. Well, I guess I, if, I, if I could say something, it seems to me that there is a, a fundamental... Uh, Ugo, Ugo, you have something, there is a, yeah. an echo. Yes, okay. Is it still there? No. Okay, good. So, um, no, it, it seems to me that there is something to to say with what you started with, with this, this idea of certainty and uh, how lawyers uh, 
don't like to deal with uncertainty. And in fact, uh, uncertainty is everywhere. Mm -hmm. And the way in which lawyers cope with uncertainty is to pretend that it's not there, yeah. right? So they create an order, which is the legal system, basically, which is a certain order that doesn't really correspond to the factual reality below it. It's an abstraction of a factual reality, which is important for purposes of measurement and for purposes of uh, reliance in order to make possible to invest money and to accumulate capital. Yeah, that's what the lawyers have been doing. Like in uncertainty, they've been creating certainty. And this time, and, and this in a way, if you think about it, it's really pretty much what happens anyway, because uh, there are always lots of uh, more or less tragic give and takes uh, in, in, a, in a typical balancing that the lawyer is doing. And and, 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 and and the lawyer at some point decide uh, or pretend they are deciding ex ante on this, on this conflict. And if they don't pretend they are deciding ex ante, then they become American legal realists, right? They say, okay, a choice for candor, we decide ex post and so on and so forth. But then in that moment, they lose uh, most of the legitimacy that the lawyers have, which is the one of being neutral and providing order and certainty and, and, and creating things ex ante so that then the system can develop around that hypothesis. Now here, it seems to me that there is uh, some sort of a generalized uh, uh, investment, which I would like to understand why it happened, in uh, terrifying people in creating a huge amount of, uh, of uh, anxiety in society, in uh, making things such that uh, then even if a, a boy arrives to school and has a little cough, then everybody's terrified by the idea that it might yeah. be, you know, the next wave of coronavirus and so on and so forth. And, and we really don't know whether all of this is true or all of this is bullshit or what it is. And, and, but then as lawyers, we are certainly in a, in a very difficult situation because when we try to provide some certainty, uh, there is so much of a, the, the only certainty we can provide is basically the certainty of saying, okay, this is really bad. Let's read in a very tyrannical way the, 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 the health, the right of, of, of public health and therefore back up the executive power in deciding, you know, in, in this emergency what to do. And, 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 and so we, are, we really are, 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 are unable to do what we best do, which is uh, balancing, right? Or anyway, taking into consideration a uh, plurality of interests and trying to accommodate them in a way to organize a, some principle. So that mm -hmm. we cannot do here because there is really no principle in all this anxiety. You know, if they would start uh, terrifying people about uh, whenever there is a pattern of uh, terrorism happening in, in, so, in, in, in social media, in public media, in newspapers, in radio, in TV, and so on and so forth. In front of that, uh, there is very little that reason can do. Very, very little. It's, 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 it's the triumph of unreasonableness. And there arrives the lawyer and say, oh, this would be the reasonable solution. And they say, you know, who cares? Um, and, and here is where, you know, certainty then seems to me is looked in two other things. One is authority in the sense of power, mere power. And the other is technology. The, 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 the hope to be able to predict through uh, technological media, you know, apps uh, and so on and so forth. And this is where the two certainties are taken. One from power, one from technology, and the law is in between there and uh, is really the big loser of this, uh, of this state of affairs. It seems to me that this is, might be pretty much a description of, of, of what is going on with more or less, you know, different uh, nuances. But it seems to me that this can be quite a, uh, an accurate vision. So your idea of this uh, thing of the certainty seems to me that it's quite crucial here. Yeah, but... Um... But I think it's our task. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm addressing us first and not the, the, not the clients 
of law. I mean, the, 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 what, what are we doing? I mean, what are we producing? And I would say we should really um, understand what we are producing. As you said, with the, that we, we offer a legal order, which is actually a fake certainty because it doesn't give any certain. The, our legal order doesn't really help in, in a pandemic. Our legal order doesn't really prevent me from being run over by a car. It doesn't help me from being killed by somebody who wants to murder me. It doesn't, the legal order that is not even able to, I would say, to get rid of the, the right wing extremists. So if we, if we are willing to take a step back from, from this fake certainty, and then we would say, okay, let's just try. And then, then we would address the problem that Mariella raised that we, so how can we do this? Because it's so easy if we have, let's say, if we have state offices, governments, the whole system of governance, they run the show for us and we just hope it's okay. And if it's fairly democratic, we accept it. And if it's not so democratic, we, we can um, hope that we can correct it at the next election. But I think that's not good enough. I think we really have to realize in our teaching that authority is not something, is not a thing, but is a relationship. And maybe that also answers the part of Mariella's question, that we have to, that authority is a relationship that we make somebody like Marx once said in a beautiful the passage the sort of somebody is king because we uh, it sort of make him the king and we are the subjects because we sort of uh, the king says you are my subjects so i think we have to realize that uh, that we have to move away and this is even it's it's much less than what lawrence suggested it's not really anarchist it's just very basic that we break down the relationship at the bottom of law, the authority of law, rather than sort of accept them as a, a thing that we need to have, because if we don't have this thing, this, this I would say power thing, then the whole country will fall apart. I think it's really difficult. And I'm not saying it's without risks, but I think the avoidance of risk it, doesn't help at all and if my argument would be look at what happened um, since roughly 1993 when all the police laws uh, morphed into these security laws and and there was the it was anti-terrorism and against organized crime and then of course even the modest rule of law structures were shattered and we didn't get any security but we, 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 the whole, I mean, I would say uh, we had a, a legal structure that in the end was destroyed. Thank you, yeah. Gunther and Ugo. Ugo, want, you want to say no, something? No, just, uh, you're right. But then the, 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 the outcome is that, that you re progressively realize that we've been uh, selling uh, fake news to the world since yeah. uh, 10th centuries. Uh, and and creating fake certainties on which, however, for a while, uh, capital has been very, very happily relying in sure. order to reproduce itself. And whenever there is a, a wave of these uh, disasters, we realize in certain areas that, you know, even if we are not there, things go on happily anyway. You know, like, uh, in, or happily or less happily, but, you know, since w in the 70s when they started introducing all sorts of uh, abusive power of the police have been going on and society has been uh, going on through that way. And if only they were a little less abusive than they are in the United States, people, you know, usually don't go in front of the cops telling them you have this and that and that legal limit. Yeah. You know, they kind of rely on the cops' authority and, and things work without the lawyer in all a big domain, which is law enforcement, right? And, yeah. and now it seems to me that in this particular moment, there is another big chunk uh, in which we are realizing that, uh, you know, things may go ahead without us uh, in uh, healthcare, in uh, taking care of situations uh, and, and uh, without us, without the kind of dream of certainty we've been selling. And, 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 and that is, uh, will happen. 
and um, and the point is that uh, now they which with what worries me might be a little bit of a uh, uh, to me as, as a uh, but, but but i i have this sense that now they really are realizing that they can get rid of lawyers also in the process of reproduction of capital and this is going to be because because uh, because uh, uh, computer scientists, uh, because uh, computer programs, smart contracts, and all of that, which are non-legal entities, are doing the job. And so this might just be the other step. You know, once they got rid of us in the frontier of the internet, in which they've, they've been happily living without us in the last 15 years, and now with this sort of uh, epidemic or this emphasis, emphasis on the epidemiological disaster this this use of this this getting rid of lawyers is not just on the frontier of the internet but is coming down also to the flesh and blood life so it's a big process of the anti-law that it seems to me that mm -hmm. is happening with neoliberalism and it's going on and on and on and and this and we are just another step ahead in this sort of anti-law movement and what we can construct what you're saying you know a more fantasy uh, more open-minded law and more qualitative basis a more ecological one whatever you know we try a variety of uh, of, of path but uh, those paths that we are trying don't work in the sense of uh, in which capital works and therefore are much less easy to implement in any way. They are in a way in a position of subordination rather than in the position of power. So it's like lawyers are not anymore in power. They might play a role in the, in, 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 at the level of resistance where they are not equipped, we are not equipped yet. And we'll see whether we can equip ourselves for playing a role in resistance, which means uh, doing the kind of, uh, you know, collective or self-organizations that we were, we were talking about. But knowing that for the first time in a long period of time, as a profession, we are subordinate. We are not anymore in the, in, 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 in the position of the domination. But maybe this is a good moment. I mean, because maybe. of the because it's so dramatic and because now even the neoliberals, at least this is what I observed in, in Germany or in Colombia or in other, all of a sudden the neoliberals say, wow, we have to become uh, neo-Keynesians. We have to bring the state on welfare. I mean, you have to give us money. And maybe this is a situation where the pressure from the economy is not so, I would say, not so oppressive and where we could say, okay, uh, the public health is, is sort of is the task of the day and we feel that the instruments that we are working with are not sufficient so let's try at least in addition something else and let's maybe have public health as a, a health, sort of for immediate emergency and emergency and maybe for supervision but then let's get the bring the people in if the state has all of a sudden the task to rescue the economy then we might as well say, why don't we try the people rescuing uh, the bureaucratic public health system, and then that way change it. You understand? I mean, it's, yeah. I'm I'm agreeing actually with you, which is I'm surprised. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you, Gunther and Ugo. Um, Ulrich Stege wants to say something. Ulrich, you got the floor. Yeah, no, thank you, thank you very much, and thank you for uh, Gunda for for this uh, interesting um, uh, speech and uh, and discussion. I wanted to break break it back to uh, your kind of uh, uh, of uh, uh, threat that you see about this learning process because I see effectively I see, uh, and I'm I'm not talking not specifically on the migration issue. I see a lot of things happening at the moment which are quite frightening. Which comes from a long, long time, uh, you know, situation already. Uh, mm -hmm. As uh, as soon as we see a threat, uh, terrorism or whatever, um, the state uh, learns quickly and using the threat uh, in in turning it into uh, certain measures that actually uh, are quite frightening to see uh, and uh, resembling a lot to the, uh, to what you just explained and and uh, and what happened in 1933 and things like this. 
Uh, I'm just uh, referring at the moment, if you see what the France has done after, after the uh, attacks in, uh, in Bataclan, mm -hmm. um, they closed the borders, uh, but it closed the borders for nobody, uh, expect from, uh, for uh, migrants to pass and, uh, and pushing them back. And yeah. since then, it's never been established anymore. Um, the thing, same ha happened at the moment with these uh, pandemic uh, closures. Uh, those are actually uh, on the streets with all the uh, additional measures that uh, mayors and police and whatever uh, uh, could do. Uh, those who really were controlled were those people that uh, were black and were on the street moving. Um, and I just can you refer to something which happened in, uh, in Saluzzo, which I have seen there. Uh, if uh, in one of those areas where these, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, so so being point. near Turin, for whoever doesn't yeah. know. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, it's a, it's an agriculture area where a lot of people are working in agriculture area, and obviously it's a it's a high uh, highly uh, visited spot for uh, uh, migrant workers, and. Um, and you know, as soon as an, in, an, a mobile info point would move around and seeking for uh, helping those people that are uh, in, in shelters uh, somewhere around, uh, police would come uh, immediately to this info point and, uh, uh, because they know migrants would come and they would control them. So I think it's what is really happening at the moment. And the people are, you know, citizens are, are looking at this uh, um, correctly and saying, yeah, yeah, uh, finally, they look at them. Uh, and so what, what, what is here uh, uh, striking me is a learning process from the state, <laughs> politicizing uh, the issue very much. And uh, so my question is, which is obviously, I, I, I imagine that the answer is very, very difficult to get, but um, how we can actually transform this learning process in a positive process and not in a negative process uh, that we chair. I didn't understand the last question, Ulrich. Yeah, no, the question was... Uh, no, the how last we... sentence, I, I yeah. just didn't understand it acoustically. Yes, no, my question was uh, whether, how we could transform uh, the learning process that I see very negatively uh, into a learning process which is positively uh, a process that you just describe as something that we we should try to, uh, to achieve? I, of course, I cannot really answer this. It's, it's, it's too complicated a question, but I would say to give you a, the, the, a very simple example, and that maybe only qualifies for, uh, for the area here. I'm sure that the parents of the school that I talked about, my son's school, they will not again in the future let the school bureaucracy decide without their intervention. They will not accept this like God's uh, judgment. They will say, okay, we have, we have done it before, we will do it again. And they even they offered sort of to, to, to intervene and organize. And of course it's easy, because if we, let, if, if we accept this paternalism or Ugo would probably say this imperialism that we have been gotten used to, this internal imperialism, it's easy because we don't have to do anything. So if we, if we say, yeah, we would like to be in a more experimental situation, it would mean we have to get active. We have to do something. And so you would, find, you would need people who are motivated, who, who feel they have some competence and they can do something. And that, I would say, you have this. I mean, not for everything, but... I don't want to fight, uh, I don't know, organized crime, but I think this is a moment where people say, yeah, I can do something. I can, in sort of, uh, in my terrain, I could provide protection. You understand? It's, it's not, it's, it's a beginning. And I just hope that this is, these are learning process that they will help, help or I would say they, they will undermine the very rigid authoritarian structures of the law. That's, I hope, I mean, maybe, maybe it's ridiculous. There is time for a final question, if anyone wants to take the floor. Otherwise, Gunther, you want to have a one minute of conclusions? There is, that was the conclusion. I would say that I, I don't have a, an answer for this. I just have a critique of the, let's say the, the public health paternalism and, and it, because it, it comes from the security 
development of the security laws in many, many countries. And I think it hasn't sort of, the, the, the breaking up the old rule of law structures, you could say they were sort of uh, too old anyway, and they didn't work. But what we have gotten instead, this, this surveillance state, or, you, or the, the Foucaultian uh, governance uh, type, hasn't really helped much. And so uh, we have now a different situation and maybe we have a chance. And if we use it, it's fine. If we don't use it, we won't get it soon. Thank you so much. Thank you all. Thank you. We shall have our last pandemic lecture by Lorenzo Fioramonti, uh, the Italian Minister for University and Education till last December, as a coronation of this Corona series. I'll uh, be sending you the invitation as soon as we fix uh, the date, which will be in some 10 days time. Thank so you this all was again. the coronation. <laughs> <laughs> Ciao, Gunther. <laughs> Ciao. Oh, thank you, everyone. Take Ciao. care.